Next panel discussion is entitled Regulation and Property, Allies or Enemies. Sufficiently open textured, uh, open-ended question, I, I think, to accommodate um, the four commentators we have uh, here today uh, without constraining them to, to, uh, in any way. And I'm sure we'll find that they, uh, they'll each say what they would have said um, regardless of what the uh, uh, precise topic had been called um, because we're best served by their telling us uh, what they think. Our, uh, we'll go in the, uh, in the order listed in the program and I'm going to uh, just uh, um, give the most abbreviated uh, um, introductions. Uh, we'll be hearing first from, um, from Professor Ellickson of the uh, Yale Law School, a, a refugee from Stanford. Um, then from uh, Professor uh, Creer of our uh, host institution, the University of Michigan uh, Law School, also uh, one time acquainted with Stanford. Uh, then from uh, uh, Ms. Gail Norton, who is practicing in, uh, in Denver after having served in the uh, previous administration in the Department of the Interior uh, and been associated with uh, the Hoover Institution and the Mountain States uh, Legal Foundation. Finally, uh, we'll hear from Professor Richard Stewart uh, of the Harvard Law School, um, and uh, uh, then uh, some crosstalk, and then questions uh, from the audience. So without further ado, let us hear from Professor Ellickson. Thank you. Uh, I spoke to a gathering of the Federalists a little over a year ago, and uh, at, on that occasion, uh, which was a panel or session on the Federal Constitution, I twitted the group uh, for not being true to the spirit of the Federalist Society uh, because they were focusing on a, doc a document of the central government, and that if you hang the poster of James Madison on the wall, uh, you should be a little bit worried about focusing on uh, the most centralized of our institutions. Uh, so today I was interested in seeing to what extent the Federalist Society had again fallen subject to the Beltway Syndrome uh, and overly federalized uh, our, uh, our uh, events today. And to some extent they have. I think it's much better this time. Property is a fairly decentralized institution. That's one of the reasons Federalists might like it. Um, um, but in fact, if you look at it, the panel before ours was called Property and the Constitution, as if we have one Constitution. Uh, James Madison, even though he wrote the U.S. Constitution, would be shocked that you would have a phrase called the Constitution, when in fact every state has a Constitution, and the Federalist Society in particular uh, should be interested in uh, state uh, constitutions. Um, the Federalist Society also uh, may fall guilty to the Beltway Syndrome on this occasion because it is, after all, headquartered within the Beltway, and this is it's prone to this. Uh, the eminent guests invited uh, from government are all people who have been connected to the federal government. We have four uh, federal judges. We have three uh, ex-employees of the federal government, two in the Justice Department, one in the Interior Department. These people, incidentally, are all eminently uh, worthy of being invited to this occasion. I don't want to say anything about them. Uh, on the other hand, um, my gosh, if the federal Federalist Society is only inviting federal employees uh, to its uh, events, uh, perhaps it has indeed fallen prey to the Beltway Syndrome. So I suggest uh, either that the group move to Peoria or Lubbock or whatever the current uh, non-Beltway city is, or um, uh, be very wary of falling prey to this particular phenomenon. To the American side of the Beltway. <laughs> <laughs> the American side, is that what I hear? Yeah. Um, I have, uh, by, by the fact my name comes first alphabetically, I can make the obvious point that all the panelists would make, which is that the question put for us today is, uh, um, uh, not very artfully put. Uh, the question is regulation and property, colon, allies or enemies. Uh, and this sort of does offer red meat to the libertarians among us because we have a white hat here and a black hat, the white hat being property, the black hat being regulation, and the initial response might be, of course, the answer is enemies. Uh, the more we think about it, and every panelist could have said this, but I get to go first, so I say it first. Uh, the obvious point here is that property is a form of regulation. 
That's what property is. Uh, examples. And I'll give you two examples of the least regulated environment you can imagine and show you that even in those environments, it is true that property is a form of regulation. One environment is an environment with Blackstonian or Libertarian or Ellen Frankel Paulian property where a landowner has a total right to exclude others and has no constraints on use. In that regime, notice that if it's enforced by government, there is a system of regulation and it is against the activity of trespassing. Government is regulating trespassing in order to produce this Blackstonian system of property. So even in that regime, property consists of a set of regulations against entry. Secondly, let's take a more anarchic regime like Bill Miller's uh, regime in Iceland 800 years ago or something like that. You'd say there, government's not doing anything. Uh, clearly there is no regulation. Uh, I would say, broadly defining regulation, even in Iceland 800 years ago, uh, there is regulation. Uh, the difference is that the regulations are enforced through more diffuse social forces. They're not being enforced by government. Because what happens in Iceland if trespass occurs repeatedly um, upon somebody's fenced property? Um, I don't know directly. I'm not a student of Iceland. Uh, that's a very small circle of people. Uh, tend to be anarchists who are interested in this. Um, I can tell you um, from my, I did some work in Shasta County that Carol Rose was nice enough to refer to uh, yesterday, and I have some sense of the way those people did business about what would happen in Iceland, which is that eventually after you've warned this person not to trespass, is you start uh, using violence against them. And uh, this pattern of social practice, if you will, constitutes a system of regulation, but it's enforced uh, through a set of norms. Now that set of regulations is in fact very, very common. Uh, we just witnessed it out in the hall as we lined up for coffee. Uh, Professor Creer on this panel, uh, in a impulsive move moment, uh, thought that he could use his status as a forthcoming panel member, I think, to break into line. Um, <laughs> uh, and then he thought better of it, that he is a well-socialized individual, and he actually moved to the back of the line, and he recognized that there were rules of property, if you will, in places in line, and that conceivably, uh, that members of this audience would have used various self-help measures against him had he not honored this rule. Uh, similarly, we have well-developed rules of property rights on the use of basketball courts. Who gets to use them next? Uh, there's a book that I, an excerpt from which I use in teaching my property class involving the lobster men of, of Maine. Uh, it's a book called The Lobster Gangs of Maine by James Atchison. Uh, it turns out that although there's no law subdividing the ocean bays off Maine for lobstering purposes, there are extremely well-developed rules of property rights which are enforced informally by the lobster gangs. And if you go out and set your lobster traps as an outsider, they will start off by warning you and then cutting your traps and then it gets worse and worse. And in fact, it never gets that worse because in fact it works so well that these trespasses simply do not occur. So even in anarchy, we do in fact have systems of regulation, although they do not uh, come from uh, government. Uh, this is not unique to our species. Uh, uh, in fact, there is territoriality among animals, uh, so that if the wolves can do it, uh, using the same high plane that Bill Miller established yesterday, they do it with urine, I should say, uh, uh, that if the wolves can do it, uh, it may be possible that property rights would emerge without states. Uh, therefore, property is regulation, uh, and we have to ask other questions. Uh, the two questions that are interesting, I think, are, uh, how can we identify a property regime or a regulatory regime, since they're equivalent in a way, as a good regime or a bad regime? And through what agencies would we like our property rules or regulatory rules uh, to emerge? Uh, very briefly, I have views on that. Uh, I am a utilitarian, I should, I should say. Um, uh, as Carol Rose, let's say, defined it uh, last night. And I, I agree with Richard Epstein that in fact the common law, I think, is unmistakably utilitarian in the crunch. So that uh, when the issue arose whether or not a person was privileged to enter somebody else's land out of private necessity because wolves were chasing them or something, uh, the common law always sacrificed a libertarian conception of property for a more utilitarian conception. And so therefore, I think this is not a untraditional view of the world. Uh, my own view on the entities which are most reliably make rules are 
fairly anarchistic, which is that I think spontaneous social forces, when social conditions are right, people are close-knit, in fact, tend to make uh, pretty reliable rules of property. And very often the rules involving basketball court use or lobster gangs in Maine, for example, are rules that I think work pretty well. So I tend to want to decentralize the creation of rules all the way out of law, uh, not be a legal centralist, and let uh, 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 use law as the last resort rather than uh, the first resort. Uh, with this introduction, I will now turn to a very concrete set of property rules, those governing the use of land, and particularly make some comments about the practice of zoning, uh, which is the predominant source of rules on the use of land in our society uh, today. Uh, here we get back to having some red meat for the libertarians because there will be outrages now for many of the people in this room. Uh, the original conception of zoning was that I think that zoning would further private property in land, that the express purpose here was to uh, uh, aid the use of property by taking care of externalities that the market could not take care of. Uh, and I agree here again without going into it in detail with Carol Rose's and Richard Epstein's conception about uh, the content of a lot of rules of property are they're designed to overcome transaction cost problems uh, in the market. And the original conception of zoning was that land uses create externalities, that people will be unable to coordinate by contract or whatever. Let's have an administrative agency get involved with those issues uh, rather than using something cumbersome like nuisance law. And this was thought to perhaps uh, add to the total value of property. Uh, I follow this institution. It's very hard to follow it. Uh, because there are 10,000 or more governments who engage in zoning and there are very few empirical studies of what they do. So anytime you try to generalize about what's going on out there, you're doing it at your peril because we don't know a whole lot. And that's why in fear of this uh, danger, that's why Dick Stewart and Jim Creer and others have uh, studied, uh, focused their academic careers on much simpler um, uh, regulatory regimes, namely federal statutes administered by single uh, agencies. But some of us have tried to persevere with these more difficult uh, kinds of topics. <laughs> and some of us succeed and some of us fail, right? Uh, here are a few uh, uh, risky, uh, perhaps failing generalizations about the practice of zoning. Uh, I would argue that zoning as it is practiced uh, by and large in the United States today uh, often, instead of making land use more efficient in its allocation, uh, makes it less efficient. And some obvious examples that are commonly practiced would be the practice of large lot zoning, which is in the self-interest of suburbanites uh, in almost all places. Uh, economists say this makes metropolitan areas sprawl much farther than they otherwise would, raises the price of housing, has uh, um, segregates people by social class more than is desirable, and whatever. I will also predict, however, that most of the people in this room, even though you're Federalists, that once you have your house in the suburbs, uh, you will somehow uh, come to the belief uh, that this is a, a valuable institution and that you will fight to keep it. Zoning is popular among almost all segments uh, of political life in the United States. Um, uh, another thing that don't zoners do is they zone land for open space, essentially, uh, in California or even in Illinois, you sometimes have minimum lot sizes of 120 acres or something like that, which is basically the size of a farm. Uh, this has been sustained by the courts in those states. My guess is if governments had to pay to acquire that kind of, those kinds of development rights, they would never do it, but this is the product of zoning as it is currently practiced. So we get, by and large, bad allocation in many cases. I'm sure in some cases, in many instances, zoning, in fact, improves the allocation of land resources, but there are lots of evils out there. Uh, the second point is that, as a process, zoning is a very wasteful process, probably more wasteful than other ways of doing the same sort of thing. And here, the, the, the notion of rent-seeking, I think, is, in fact, a, a useful one. Imagine Donald Trump applying to New York City for permission to build a skyscraper. Um, when Donald Trump, if Donald Trump were to get uh, approval for the skyscraper, there would be an immediate increase in the value of the lands that Donald Trump has. And in fact, Donald Trump's great skill is at massaging political processes and getting these kinds uh, of approvals. Uh, 
So when Donald Trump goes to the city, it turns out that there's a, there are a lot of rents uh, there and a lot of people are trying to grab them, Donald Trump himself being the main one, obviously. The city and its employees can try to grab them, however, and I regard a lot of land use regulation as a jobs program for planners and lawyers who in fact enrich themselves through this kind of process, environmental impact statements and reports being a good example of that. Uh, secondly, other people can come out of the woodwork and try to get these rents at this point. Uh, we have examples in Los Angeles of the uh, artists. Uh, the museum was created uh, as, the, as a condition for approval. In New York City, it's the theater groups. In New Haven, it's the unions uh, conditioning approval of a hotel upon the promise of the hotel builder of a not fighting unionization at the hotel. So all sorts of rent seekers come out and make this a very long and costly process. Uh, so in general, uh, I regard zoning not to have worked as an ally of property, but rather as its enemy. Uh, my own view, uh, since I'm uh, being asked to uh, shut down my remarks quite properly here, uh, are that um, uh, the great mistake made here was from by zoners originally was to underappreciate to what extent people could coordinate more informally, that there are norms that govern setbacks, all the things governed by variances today, I think arguably could be handled without law at all, that norms of neighborliness and whatever would constrain people and that would be a much cheaper way of handling that set of problems. Other problems like air pollution I think could not have been handled that well uh, um, by that system. Uh, this puts me a minority in the land use field because most people in the land use field say local zoning is no good, the proper solution is move to a higher level of regulation, let's have regional zoning, let's have state zoning, and there I think empirically we can say Look at Hawaii, that's the first state to do it. They're the first state to have state zoning and housing prices in Hawaii since that time have been sky high, uh, that in fact you get into more trouble by having more regulation rather than re less regulation in this context. Um, uh, I will stop at this point and uh, I think I can anticipate Jim Creer's remarks and I'll make a remark about the Detroit Tigers and their center fielder I think in response to his uh, forthcoming statements. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Career? Just for the record, as I was trying to break into the coffee line, Bob was on the side saying, grab a cup for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> I want to begin uh, by publicly acknowledging the debt to Steve Williams that should have been acknowledged a long time ago. He didn't have the faintest idea what it is. And, um, it has to do with um, my big red little brown book um, property book, probabilistically about half of you, at least students in here are familiar with this book anyway. The, f the, f the fact that you bought it should uh, give you pause in thinking about the, the clear line between a forced sale and a voluntary transaction. <laughs> and um, Bob referred to, um, Bob referred uh, via urine to Bill um, discussion last night of excrement. This sort of continues in that vein just for a second. Um, in saying that though, I, um, my colleague Joe Vining uh, talks about a Michigan school. I don't want you to get the wrong impression as um, the Michigan contingent all focuses on this same kind of thing. But <laughs> there's a discussion of feudal tenures in this property book written by my co-author and an example he gives is that one Roland is recorded as having held 110 acres for which on Christmas Day every year he was to perform before the king all together in once, a leap, a, puffle, a puff, and a fart. Um, it was Steve who many years ago, when Jesse and I were both at UCLA, was kind enough to write Jesse a letter saying that he had a student, or was it the student's wife anyway, who was a student of the Renaissance and who pointed out that a fart was a Renaissance dance. Um, I want to acknowledge Steve's contribution to that. We, did, we didn't note this in the book for the obvious reason, but it's, this, is, it's, this is a debt that's been working at me for a long time. And, you know, I wrote out my whole talk. I'm real insecure, okay? <laughs> right up here it says, Gail will tell you, it says, Right up here. I wrote out my whole talk. I'm real insecure. Okay? Point to sign. 
And here's my first line. It says, I'm going to talk fast because I don't have a whole lot to say, all right? And then last night, I'm sitting, listening to Richard Epstein. <laughs> and I remembered the scene in Crocodile Dundee when the mugger comes up with a knife and says, you know, get me, and the guy says, no, and she says, do it, Crocodile, he's got a knife, and he says, oh, that's not a knife, this sort of phallic scene, that's a knife. <laughs> I'm not fast, Richard is fast. <laughs> it's like a miracle, almost, I think. <laughs> But then I realized what the miracle really was, was that it precisely at the end of 15 minutes, it just stopped. <laughs> and the image that came to my mind was, just see Niagara Falls freeze instantly. <laughs> uh, I was writing to a friend of mine the other day, in fact, my co-author in the property book, and I mentioned in passing, that I was about to speak at the annual meeting of the Federalist Society, which I described to him as a group of arch conservatives. And knowing that he wouldn't know who the hell the Federalists were, I told him that they like to spice up their annual gathering of the faithful by inviting a few people like me, a few non-conservatives, I avoid the word liberal, <laughs> to take the podium much in the spirit of throwing some Christians to the lions was the way I described it. <laughs> Now you all laugh, you see, but the, the way I, I like putting it that way because of the wonderful ambiguity about just who are the Christians and just who are the lions. Since I can engage in some conservative bashing now if I want to, Lord knows there are abundant opportunities. I decided to be kind um, and I am amazed to see that no one has yet told a John Tower joke. I will. <laughs> I've tried it on one person who lives in Boston because I didn't want it to leak. And he said not to worry, it wasn't funny anyway. <laughs> I thought it was clever. Um, so, I mean, I simply said that John Tower never had a chance. For de several decades, after all, a band of religious fundamentalists has been going door to door, handing out pamphlets that right there on the cover warn the American public to keep their eye on the guy. That's the joke, you can all laugh. <laughs> when you figure it out, all right, all right. Anyway, I'm not here to uh, bash, ba yeah, your late giggles will show a very slow connection speed, okay, so. Um, I'm not here to bash conservatives or devour them maybe just on grounds of Pascal's wager that perhaps I'm one of those myself, I don't really know. An especially charming member of your group was a student of mine last year, spent a lot of the year talking to me in a monologue that ran many sound bites to the minute and innumerable minutes to the hour that I was a conservative and she convinced me of two things. First of all, that whatever it is that conservatives conserve, it's not energy. <laughs> Second, I was clearly a non-liberal, at least. Okay. Well, my the line now says, is my time up yet? Okay, because it's, <laughs> it's troublesome to go on, given the question at hand. When I first heard the question some months ago, and I saw the nature of the occasion, Christians and lions and all of that, and I saw how little time I had to roar or to kneel and pray, depending on your point of view, I felt frustrated. The question runs like this. Is there a God? You have 15 minutes to talk, okay? <laughs> So I decided to be utterly agnostic. The question is regulation and property, allies or enemies, and my answer is an emphatic yes. <laughs> <laughs> now yesterday, as I, was, I finally figured out what I meant by that, and I've tried to time things, and I'm doing a good job, I think, so that I'll barely be able to tell you what the meaning is. I want to distinguish for purposes of my discussion between what I'll call the managerial nature of property and regulation on the one hand, and the ideological nature of each of those things on the other. On the managerial side, I say that property and regulation are allies. So my answer to that part of the question is yes. On the ideological side, I say that property and regulation are surely enemies. So again, my answer to that side of the question is yes. My bottom line, and there's not gonna be much time for more than a bottom line, is that the ideological side of things will, for a special reason, come to dominate deliberations and discussions about property and regulation, and that this in turn will invigorate, and perhaps already has, the nature of political discourse in the country in a manner that I think anyone should regard as healthy. <laughs>
whether that anyone is a conservative or liberal, a Christian, a lion, or an agnostic like me. Now, for my text, I draw from Thomas Gray, Stanford Law School, former colleague, an article he wrote called The Disintegration of Property. And I'm just going to use this as an inspiration rather than a guide. So if I abuse Tom's observations, um, it's in all innocence. In a nutshell, no pun intended, this is what Tom argued. He said, long ago, property was thingified. That's my term. Designating a relationship between a person and a thing, what Alex was talking about last night, that was absolute. But what Alex overlooked last night, and I guess what I overlooked in teaching Alex some years ago, was that the very fact that property once designated a relationship between a person and a thing that was absolute, well, it followed that it also designated a relationship between a person and his things on the one hand and the rest of the world on the other that was also pretty absolute. This conception of property, and this is well known, was one dimensional, it was fixed, it was rigid, and it was as strong and concrete as concrete. It seemed to serve to mark a space for each individual. It was a fortress against all other individuals, including the government, and it rested on very sturdy philosophic foundations, mostly provided by Locke in the theory of labor and Hegel in the theory of, prop of uh, personality. This is the conception of property that generated in early American state constitutions mention of property as a natural right. It was the conception that inspired Blackstone description of property referred to already by Professor Rapkin as a man's place of soul and despotic dominion, in short, a place of freedom and autonomy in the most fundamental sense. Now, what Gray argued was that this conception of property withered, naturally enough, however ironically, with the growth of capitalism and then the industrial economy and then the activist welfare state. It all began as people, through voluntary transactions, unbundled property for the sake of the division of labor and of function and for the sake of economies of scale in a rising capitalism. Because unbundling property now becoming multidimensional and this familiar bundle of rights that we talk about aided and abetted industrialization on Gray's argument by providing new means of organization of finance and in addition and eventually, unbundling provided a conception that could be manipulated by the legal realists, remember Hofeld in particular, for the sake of the activist state, because solid bundled property now no more was the chief thing that had before stood in the state's way. As an aside, I think a perfect example of this point is the relation between property and the takings clause. For once property was conceptually unbundled, one part of a piece of property could be taken without having to admit that any had really been taken at all because so much remained. The remainder became reformed as the whole bundle, making it easy to see that you could keep carrying this process out bit by bit until only the last bit remained. And of course, that could be taken too because it wasn't much after all. Well, back to Gray and the story about disintegration of property led him to two conclusions. I want to be emphatic about this. This is what my talk is about. One, it came to be, and I'll quote him here, that the specialists who design and manipulate the legal structures of the advanced capitalist economies could easily do so without using the term property at all. And I want you to bear this in mind as having to do with the managerial side of my remarks. And two, Gray said, the consequence is that property forever ceased to stand as a central category in legal, in legal and political discussion. And I want you to bear this in mind as having to do with the ideological side of my remarks. Now, on the side of the managerial, I think Gray is exactly right, and on the side of the ideological, I think he's exactly wrong. Let me take the managerial first. And I simply mean by managerial, the use of property and regulation as alter and norms, if you like, I don't care, as alternative ways to manage a society to whatever ends one wishes, whether it's efficiency or waste, wealth or poverty. And I think in this regard, several things follow from the disintegration of property that Gray notes. And he himself said one of these things, the property regulation divide becomes no longer useful as a way to talk in the managerial setting. I mean, you can manage through property rights and the market on the one hand or through regulation and the government on the other or through a mix and why not just do whatever works? There's this way and that way and there's a little more to it, no matter whether you call it regulation or property because it's all regulation or all property, as Bob said. It's just different means to whatever is the same desired managerial end. So in writing this, I anticipated that Bob would perhaps use land use as an instance in his own remarks and say that property and regulation are in many ways two sides of the same coin, the managerial coin. 
Largely, I anticipated this because Bob told me on the phone the other day that this is what he was going to say. <laughs> you can manage land use through a form of regulation called property rights, covenants, and the like, through regulation called zoning, through a mix, and some means are good at one thing, and some at another, and sometimes the mix is best, and it's just a pure instrumental question. So people have called nuisance law judicial zoning, and they, zoning can be seen as trading property rights, and you can have a government program of regulation through a certain kind of constrained market and call it non-zoning, as in Houston, and there you are. Property and regulation, on this view, are just tools. The market and the government are just alternative means to the same end, whatever it is you want to maximize. The market always needs a little regulation to exist and function. The market and the regulator can always find it handy to use property rights to his purposes. The rest is all details. Here's an example from Dick Stewart, who I didn't talk to about any of this. I expect Dick's going to talk about marketable rights to control pollution. One could as well talk about marketable development rights to govern land use, marketable coupons to ration baby making, or private versus public schools, or whatever. Is this property, or is this regulation? In managerial terms, not only who's to say, but who cares? It's all in the spirit of what works. So what works? Now I have to pick up to Epstein's speed and do the rest in exactly one minute if I don't want to do these boundary crossings for which one gets in trouble. An essential assertion of my argument is that commonly you can't tell what works in managerial terms. Whether for reasons that spring from Tom Gray's analysis or not, I think the designification of property leads to utter ambiguity from the managerial side of things. It's not black hats and white hats, it's all gray hats. Given a busily interacting bundle of rights, privileges, liabilities, obligations, and so on, in the context of a busily interacting group of people, we simply have too many facts about how unbalanced everything works out in the real world. We have so much information that in the end we don't have any. Everything's indeterminate. If an enthusiast of the activist state wants to show that zoning is a great thing, facts abound. And if you as a good conservative want to show otherwise, they abound again. Consider as an example something from a recent New Republic, which is a wonderful hallmark, hallmark of its own schizoid character, has taken to printing self-canceling headlines garnered from newspapers here and there. So the New Republic reports that in January when the Boston Globe carried a headline that said, quote, Massachusetts anti-snob zoning found ineffective. On January 2nd, the same paper ran a headline that said, quote, Massachusetts anti-snob rule called a success. Now, you think it's funny. I don't doubt for a minute that each of those headlines is absolutely accurate and correct. From my reading, no matter what the claim, there are abundant facts on each side of it. People go for years to graduate school just to learn to gather these facts and put them at the service of any viewpoint, any viewpoint. In consequence, nobody's ever right or is it ever wrong from a managerial point of view unless he's too poor to hire a fact finder. So for every Dick Stewart who can make an utterly convincing case for the dramatic gains to be realized through marketable pollution rights, there is a fervent but intelligent environmentalist who can show exactly the opposite. Whatever the so-called facts underline the argument, at least in any interesting case, there's only so much thrust and parry, so many competing realities. For every Sam Peltzman, there's a Mark Kelman. For every Huber, there's a Luddite, as he seemed to concede last night. For every Viscusi, there is a Calabrese, and I guess I should now say for every Calabrese, there's a Calabrese. <laughs> Finally, for every Easterbrook, there's a Westerbrook, okay? <laughs> Now you're thinking computers. I say computers will add nothing to resolving these factual disputes about what manages best, property or regulation. Computers will only add to, just, to each side just what the other name of computers suggests, which is to say artificial intelligence. So I say Gray was right. Virtually everything has been going for us for many years without anyone ever really needing or bothering to talk about property as a concrete idea because the lines of property itself got soft and blurred and lost through unbundling, and the argument came to center on management. The argument, in short, came to be not about fundamentals, but about outliers. It came to be put in terms of the pros and cons of instrumental fact that cannot, in our very post-Newtonian world, ever serve as reliable stepping stones to resolution. Now you should see the happy side of the story. The argument from management is getting swamped by facts. The situation's an utter mire. There's no firm managerial ground to stand on. And precisely this leads me to conclude that Gray is wrong in thinking that property must be written off as a central category of political thought. In other words, as an important ideology. We haven't seen the end of ideology, but exactly the opposite. Let's face it. The argument about management was never really about management anyway. Ideology has always been shaping the facts rather than the other way around, which is why for every Peltzman there's a Kelman. The great disservice done by the managerial debate and by instrumental rationality, by the ubris of thinking that we could actually figure the world out in terms of cause and effect relationships and then manage the complicated parts of the world from that perspective has been that good ideological talk got lost 
covered and overwhelmed by noise. As a result, there's probably been, I think, a bit of co-optation along the way. Take again the case of marketable pollution rights and look at them for a moment ideologically rather than merely in managerial terms. Are these new rights really an incursion by market ideology into regulation, which is what now Stephen Kelman maintains? Or might they, on the contrary, be an incursion by the activist state fell still further into the market, which was what I'm inclined at times to suspect, which is not to say I think it's a bad thing. The program almost seems to be that if you say not that you're regulating, but rather marketeering, a lot of good conservatives will fall in line in service to an activist state and join in supporting fewer property rights in the name of more. Those conservatives caught up in a fruitless debate about management have perhaps lost sight of ideology and been co-opted. And good liberals, someone like Bruce Ackerman, cheer them on them and marketable rights at the same time. But the property regulation debate can't keep going on in terms of management, and if there is co-optation, it's likely to stop, or at least to surface as an issue. The managerial debate can't continue because it doesn't have any ground. It's a swamp. Ideology is all that's left, the only place to stand firm. The facts are a bog. Without facts, one turns to faith, and nothing generates avid political discussion like ideology and faith, never mind the facts which is exactly what Gray overlooked in thinking that property had long since died as a political idea. Give me religion and I'll give you heated and ongoing political discussion. I'll give you an Epstein on the one side, say, and a Peggy Radin on the other, talking from fundamentals, from Locke and Hegel, never mind the unmanageable, managerial aspects of things, never mind the messy facts exactly because they are too messy to be useful. Without facts, it's all religion and likely to be practiced with fervor. So I predict the resurgence of good ideological or even almost theological debate built upon worthwhile competing faiths rather than relatively worthless competing facts. Pure zeal will more and more motivate discussion and move it to fundamentals. In other words, and I'm going to close on a note that's unduly sentimental for such a non-sentimental occasion, ignorance will lead us to the truth that the right questions to engage are those imponderable ones about appropriate relations between citizens and their government. Thank you. Bob Ellickson predicted that some things might be covered by the first speakers so that the later comers would not be covering them, and I will dispense with the discussion of why property is both an enemy and an ally of regulation. I will move immediately to a discussion of how to protect property from regulation. How do we restore a regime of property rights? I'd like to discuss a few things that are happening on that front. I'm involved as the author of a report that is being done by the Pacific Research Institute Task Force on Property Rights. This is a group of very distinguished people pulled together to discuss ways in which we might develop an ACLU-type litigation strategy for preserving property rights. Among the people in that group are Richard Epstein, Gideon Canner, Gary Lawson, Mike McConnell, Randy Mar Barnett, Roger Pilon, Peter Ferreira, uh, and quite a few others. I'd like to mention that Chip Meller, the president of Pacific Research Institute, is here today and would certainly be glad to discuss this with you. The second thing I would like to mention is that we're approaching an anniversary. March 15th marks the first anniversary of the issuance of President Reagan's executive order dealing with takings. Uh, it is surprising that the executive order has received as little publicity as it has. It comes up with a very unique approach. It asks the federal agencies to move from their environmental analysis and their regulatory impact analysis to do a takings analysis. The agencies are asked to look through their regulations and determine whether their regulations are likely to affect takings of property 
and to estimate what the effect of those regulations is going to be on the federal budget. As you might expect, the agencies are not wildly enthusiastic about this whole idea. And they keep coming back with the idea that, uh, obviously, they're not taking anything. They are not going to have to pay out of the federal treasury for their activities. Uh, it appears that on closer analysis and with a little bit of pressure, uh, the agencies may be coming back with something a little more significant. We still need to, to wait and see. Compensation is the key issue in analysis under the takings clause. We need to look at why compensation is important. First of all, of course, is the fairness to the person who is being harmed by a regulation. The classic form formulation is that in fairness and justice, one individual should not be forced to bear the burden that ought properly to be borne by society as a whole. Secondly, compensation tends to limit government action. Even though bureaucrats enjoy the benefit of being able to spend other people's money, they still are somewhat constrained in terms of the agency budget in the actions that they can undertake if they must pay compensation when those actions interfere with private property rights. This also results in a slight limitation on transfer activity. The political cost must take into effect some financial cost, and therefore there is some break on the system that puts everyone's property rights up for grabs. Finally, the payment of compensation helps balance out the competition between social interaction by regulation and so social interaction by private voluntary contractual arrangements. If it's cost-free to go for regulatory ways of working out conflicts, as that cost goes up, we start looking at other approaches that may not be as cost-free, but may in the long run be more beneficial. I'm going to look at when compensation should be paid for regulation and focus primarily on the environmental area, on pollution and land use issues. The executive order has generated criticism in the environmental community and I'd like to discuss and describe just a little bit uh, some criticism that has been leveled by Jerry Jackson, a former attorney with National Wildlife Federation. He said the executive order requires an impossibility because it requires the agencies to try and figure out under the current takings law what actions might be unconstitutional takings. On that point, I tend to agree with him. The takings law is currently such a mess, it is very difficult to figure out what is and is not going to be found to be a taking. The Supreme Court has not provided clear guidance in this area. I disagree strongly, however, with Jackson in what he sees to be the role of the Constitution in executive agency decision making. He seems to believe that the only way in which the Constitution figures into an executive agency's decision is that long after the fact, a court finally deals with the issue and decides that yes, indeed, there was a taking. Up to that point, the agency should be oblivious of the taking's implications. He says, quote, whether a permit denial might be construed by a court to affect a taking is not a relevant factor in an agency's decision to grant or deny the permit, absent express legislative authority making it a factor. I'd be real interested to see that legislative authority be something along the lines of, in this case, the Constitution applies. <laughs> he also notes that this executive order on takings may have a chilling effect on regulation. I view that as something positive. <laughs> I'd like to go through just a few of the, the possible formulations that might be used in trying to decide when a regulation in the area of, of environmental controls ought to result in compensation. And since we're looking at alternatives, we'll, I'll 
act like a good bureaucrat and, and look at the extreme alternatives. Uh, let's, let's first say that uh, there is absolutely no police power or nuisance exception to the taking requirement. Government pays whenever it regulates something that interferes with private property rights. In a way, this would be easy to administer. You just look at the property value before and after the regulation is imposed. However, government would be paying to halt even what we would view as some of the worst offenses. Uh, one <coughs> wonders what the compensation level would be in trying to close down a crack house. Probably mind-boggling. In this case, we have very little justification for taking money from the taxpayers to stop something that is an injury of the type that would ordinarily be seen as just someone following right social behavior. It also opens it up to problems of someone coming back time and time again with, well, this time you've paid me to close down the crack house, uh, now it's time to pay me to close down the bordello, and next week you can pay me for closing down whatever I dream up next time. So it's certainly open to exploitation by re repeat offenders. Looking at the other extreme, uh, let's assume that government doesn't have to pay at all unless it chooses to label its action <coughs> condemnation. Again, this is also easy to administer. In fact, even more easy. We never have to worry about what we pay for. But clearly, there's no protection for individual rights. A formulation that has actually been adopted by the courts is a nuisance exception. There's no taking, I mean, no compensation if a taking is done pursuant to the police power in regulating a nuisance. The problem is in trying to define the police power. If the police power is very broadly interpreted, as it was, uh, for example, in the license cases uh, back in 1847, nothing more or less than the powers of government inherent in every sovereign to the extent of its dominions. <coughs> that covers quite a bit. There's also, it also should be pointed out that there's no textual support in the Constitution for a, an exception for police powers. When the police power is defined so broadly, we run into another problem, and that is that the public use requirement in the takings clause has been interpreted as being coterminous with the police power. That leaves you an empty box when compensation would be awarded. A taking is appropriate if it's done pursuant to the police power and pursuant to public use, but no compensation is necessary because it falls in the public use exception. There's a much better formulation that gets at something very similar, and that is to look at the extent of the property rights involved. Presumably, there is no actual property right in maintaining a nuisance. Thus, one is not involved in a taking when one halts a nuisance because there's no property right there to take. The Keystone decision states this rule but then the analysis proceeds to ignore it. There was clearly a property right under state law, but the Supreme Court proceeded as if there were no property right there. One question we also run into on this is what is a nuisance? Is a nuisance to be interpreted by the pure common law? Is a nuisance synonymous, synonymous with a negative externality? If so, we have a problem with aesthetic harm. I'm from Denver. I'm a Broncos fan. At least I watch about half of every Super Bowl game that they're involved in. <laughs> a few years ago, when we were in our first Super Bowl, there was a, a major craze to paint one's house orange. <laughs> If I lived across the street from one of those places, I would certainly view that harm to myself as an interference with my right to use my own property. But I doubt that we really want to get into regulating aesthetic harm in that way. 
We next look to whether a physical invasion is necessary that does away with the problem of a purely aesthetic harm, but it also can allow a lot of regulation if you start looking at every amount of pollutant as being a physical invasion. Uh, in that case, all of us, when we drive our cars, are engaged in an activity that might be regulated uh, and would be justified in being regulated by the government. And it's, it's very hard to draw the line as to what activity we might be able to engage in that would not create the kind of uh, excuse for government regulation. Next, we could look at having some kind of reasonable right to use our land. That puts some limitation on what the government is able to do and able not to do. Uh, this is found in the Nolan case, where Justice Scalia noted that the right to build on one's property was an actual right and not a government-granted privilege. Interestingly, we might even go as far as to include a homesteading right to pollute or to make noise in an area that would eliminate some of the theoretical problems with coming to a nuisance. Another test that has been utilized by the courts is diminution in value. If a regulation goes too far, it is a taking. The question is whether a regulation denies an owner all economically viable use of the land. Now, under that test, the courts have found that diminutions in value of 75% to 90% still are not severe enough to constitute takings. Another question is whether a, a regulation substantially advances a legitimate state interest. This is quite similar to the requirement of having a public use under the Fifth Amendment and doesn't really provide us with a good test of what should and should not be compensated. It really just looks at what should the government be doing, you know, what is it authorized to do and what is it not authorized to do. Another test is the strand in the bundle of rights test that was referred to earlier. That test has not yielded particularly enlightening results as we find that a right to exclude and a right to pass to one's heirs are significant and denial of those will be deemed to be a taking, whereas ownership of a support estate as part of a mineral interest or the right to sell, as in the case of eagle feathers in Andrus versus Allard, is not something that is significant and compensable. Another emerging way of looking at the question is the nexus requirement that was set out in the Nolan decision and that is discussed extensively in the executive order. This requires that permit conditions, uh, things like uh, 404 permit for wetlands uh, is, is one of the good examples, conditions that are put on permits must have the same health and safety objective and must substantially advance that same objective as the denial of a permit. Uh, using the, the wetlands permits as an example, it's the, the whole purpose of that regulatory program is to protect water quality. It is advanced and been interpreted to protect wetlands values. Sometimes we get requirements on those permits that are things like providing boat ramps for dams, and things like that, that, that really have no relationship to the overall purpose of the regulatory program. It'll be interesting to watch uh, as the executive order analysis develops to see how those kinds of things are treated. I have not looked at a lot of the other formulations that are involved in the takings context, uh, compensating benefits and so forth, that complicate the whole analysis still further. But it's very clear as I started out by noting that the analysis at this point is very confused and very much in need of further definition by the courts. The Property Rights Task Force will be taking a look at various ways of trying to provide some clarity to this.
And I would appreciate any input that you all might be able to provide. I'll look forward to talking with any of you later. Thank you. Well, uh, the title, again, is Regulation and Property, Allies or Enemies. So Jim said his answer is an emphatic yes, mine's an emphatic no. Um, the, the title does capture the Janus-based uh, quality of regulation. On the one hand, it can be uh, looked upon as uh, uh, traditional uh, private uh, property and private law by other means. That is, uh, a means of, of uh, protecting uh, uh, personal and property interests that are inadequately protected by the common law because of problems created, especially by industrialization. Uh, it's familiar that under industrialization, the, our common law system of uh, private remedies may adequately uh, fail, uh, may fail adequately to protect property and personal interests from infringement. Uh, widespread pollution, as Bob Ellickson noted, is a is a good example because of small stakes and collective action problems. Um, uh, there are great difficulties in in providing, uh, using the courts, for example, to deal with the problem of uh, acid, acid rain. Um, product safety regulation may be another. Imperfection and impro information imperfections in markets may produce inadequate consumer demand uh, for product safety. Uh, tort liability for defective products is a potential solution, but a decentralized case-by-case -case system of, if you will, regulation by juries is a clumsy process. And hence, uh, we have had the development of centralized regulatory schemes, uh, starting with food and drugs and moving to uh, other uh, product areas, automobiles, so forth. Um, and this is, as Bob said, an area that, that Jim and I have studied. I take exceptions that this somehow is uh, a lesser degree of difficulty than zoning, um, because it's not only, as the pollution example uh, illustrates, uh, uh, federal regulatory schemes, uh, but state governments and even local governments have a large uh, element, uh, a role in carrying this out. And uh, therefore, I would argue, uh, far more complex than uh, zoning at one level. Of Although I, uh, if I may interrupt, I understand the Breyer and Stewart casebook, which is an excellent casebook. Students do tell me that there is an entire emphasis on federal agencies and federal courts. <laughs> I haven't read your zoning book, I'm afraid. Uh, the. Uh, the other side, though, so, so regulation can be viewed as a means of, of, of protecting uh, a personal and property interests. On the other hand, we know that regulation can be a means by which economic and ideological factions uh, use the coercive power of government to infringe without compensation traditional personal and property in, uh, interests and undermine the uh, virtues of innovation, diversity, and choice uh, that are associated with decentralized uh, market-based property systems. Uh, these uh, abuses are, are well chronicled in, in public choice-oriented choice uh, studies uh, that are a new genre in the literature, I, I guess in the pollution area. Uh, the, the most notable are the Ack Ackerman-Hassler uh, studies of, uh, of coal-fired power plant regulation and, and Bob Crandall's uh, studies of, of uh, federal air pollution control uh, generally. Um, and I, at this point, I, would, I really have to take strong exception to, uh, to Jim Creer's uh, seem radical agnosticism uh, saying that we really can't evaluate uh, whether, whether these are abuses or not. I think if we really follow Jim's logic, he would have to con contend that we really are unable to choose between a Soviet-style system of central planning uh, and a market-based economy because, well, there are just too many facts uh, to evaluate. I don't think that's true. I think the truth is pretty plain, and I think it's also plain on at least the ideological values we hold dear in terms of liberty, diversity, uh, and choice, uh, that there are uh, clear instances of abuse uh, by over-reliance on centralized command and control uh, regulation. Um, now, these studies, uh, though, uh, these public choice-oriented studies should also remind us that regulation is itself a, a property rights system. Uh, Bob uh, said that property is a form of regulation, but we now know also uh, by the same token that regulation is a form of property. Uh, that uh, regulatory systems create endowments, uh, not just for bureaucrats, uh, but for those regulated, and as uh, Professor Rabkin pointed out this morning, for uh, uh, advocacy groups uh, that uh, have enforcement rights uh, under those systems uh, that they can use as a basis for uh, raising money uh, from contributors, or even, as he noted, 
uh, cashing in the right to enforcement uh, and obtaining from, uh, say, a polluter, uh, a contribution for uh, the environmental cause of their, of their choice. Um, as regulatory systems mature, these endowments uh, acquire considerable weight. Uh, they don't have, uh, as Professor Rapkin also pointed out, all of the uh, characteristics of traditional property rights. They're not often uh, alienable. Um, but uh, they are, as a practical matter, uh, make it difficult to change regulatory systems uh, once they are created because of the factions uh, that uh, have interests in this neo-feudal uh, system. Uh, and so we may say that regulation has spawned a new form of property, a reg prop, uh, which may be contrasted with the prive prop uh, created by private law litigation in the courts. And the interaction between these two systems of property uh, which I think deserves uh, continuing an urgent study, is simply another expression, if you will, uh, or manifestation of our mixed economy. Um, now, I don't think it's a happy one. Uh, uh, maybe uh, there are believers in a dialectic who say uh, uh, the interplay between these two uh, will have a happy result, but I, I take it there are not many uh, of that faith here today. Um, what is the answer? Well, the tempting thing is to say, let's sweep it away. Uh, look at the jurisprudential a wasteland of the Federal Register uh, that creates this reg prop. Uh, uh, let's sweep it away uh, through deregulation. Uh, I think uh, there's much to be said, uh, uh, many areas for deregulation, but I think in urgent matters of, of uh, product safety, pollution, and others, uh, there are pervasive failures in the common law uh, that will not allow us simply uh, to pretend that it can uh, handle the whole load. It can in many areas of, quote, economic regulation, but in many areas of, quote, social regulation, uh, it cannot. Uh, another approach is to use the constitutional technique uh, of, of, of trying to see uh, some of the abuses as unconstitutional takings. Um, and and uh, I wish Ms. Norton and her colleagues well. I, I, I really find myself associated with my friend and colleague Charles Freed on this, though, thinking that at least until uh, four Richard Epsteins are appointed to the Supreme Court, uh, there's not going to be enough purchase in constitutional litigation to do more than chip at the edges. And I think our, our, uh, our response has to be uh, largely uh, through political effort. Uh, what sort of political effort? Well, uh, here's why I have an emphatic no to the question posed by the, uh, uh, by the, um, the title. It, 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 it assumes that we really only have two options here, uh, either command and control regulation, I take it that's the reference, or uh, common law property systems, and ignores the possibility of, of intermediate or hybrid alternatives. Uh, the deliberate creation of new systems of property that can overcome common law failure while avoiding many of the abuses, characteristic abuses, of centralized command and control regulation. What is this new property? Well, I'd like to say new property, but uh, that was uh, preempted 20 years ago by Charles Reich. Uh, I'd like to come up with uh, some name for this hybrid property, uh, but I haven't, I haven't come up with a trendy one yet. Uh, but let me give some examples. One is transferable pollution permits. Jim Creer was very clever in anticipating this. How did he anticipate it? He asked me what I was going to talk about, as he asked Bob Ellickson. Uh, um, <laughs> the, uh, in fact, uh, uh, transferability of regulatory rights is something we have already started on. Uh, transfer of broadcast licenses, for example, uh, and the, uh, the bubble and emissions trading systems under the uh, Clean Air Act are examples of how even in a regulatory system you can get some efficiency, some diversity uh, gains uh, by simply making alienable uh, the, the property rights created by regulation. But a further step would deliberately create a brand new form of property right uh, to harmonize social objectives and private incentives. And uh, I, I, I do mention uh, transferable pollution permits. Basically, you decide how much pollution is going to be allowed in a basin. Uh, you probably grandfather the existing uh, regulated uh, industries, uh, hand out p uh, permits equal to their pollution for political reasons. Uh, and, and then if you want to reduce pollution, those rights are amortized over time. Uh, they'd be of limited duration, and eventually uh, they would be auctioned off by the government. If polluters are going to use the commons, uh, they ought to pay for the privilege. Um, another example of this approach would be a, uh, a refundable deposit system for um, hazardous waste. Uh, when a, a, a waste generator generates hazardous waste, uh, you have to pay a deposit to the government, and you get it back when you prove to the government that you've disposed of or treated the waste properly. So you create a new property right, a right to a deposit that goes with the waste, 
which can be sold to third persons uh, who can then uh, be in the business of efficiently uh, dealing with waste and the burden shifts to the a person who wants the refund to prove that the waste has been disposed of rather than now putting it on the government. And midnight dumpers, uh, one hopes, go out of business because it's not profitable. Uh, still another example would be increased reliance on hazard disclosure to develop uh, improved markets and safety. OSHA's hazard labeling program has really been a success, unlike most of their command and control regulation. It has increased worker awareness of risk, and workers have demanded higher compensating wage differentials for taking on riskier activities. Uh, I think uh, this could be generalized uh, through uh, national hazard warning guidelines that could then be picked up by the tort system to have some sort of coordinated uh, notion of what appropriate warnings are so that employees could use the, have a more valuable property right in their labor, a more informed one, and consumers uh, a more uh, informed uh, right to dispose of their uh, uh, income. Uh, for products whose, whose characteristics they know. So uh, these, uh, these are examples of the creation of new hybrid or, or augmented forms of property to achieve uh, overall social objectives uh, that cannot be achieved by the common law uh, while avo avoiding the characteristic abuses of command and control regulation. Uh, now, of course, these are not a panacea. Proponents of regulation may fa fear they will fail to achieve their objectives. Critics may fail they will be exploited by rent seekers. But uh, the, there's an overwhelming practical objection, which is the neo-feudal property rights we have created in our existing regulatory schemes. Uh, the bureaucrats, the regulated industry, environmental and other advocate, advocacy groups who learn their, earn their livelihood through administrative and enforcement law are going to impose uh, the creation of these new, uh, new systems. Uh, and academics and policy analysts uh, like us who advocate greater reliance are not uh, going to prevail, even though I disagree with Jim, uh, the facts and logic are strongly on our side. Uh, what, is going to, what is going to sweep away uh, uh, these uh, 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 neo-feudal uh, property rights uh, in command and control regulation? Well, uh, here I think that there are two uh, generative forces uh, that are going to do the job. One is uh, limits on federal taxes that Charles Fried referred to. Uh, command and control regulations is expensive for the government, uh, and uh, I think the budget situation is going to uh, place real limits on, on uh, government's capacity to continue to operate uh, this uh, clumsy Soviet-style approach to producing cleaner air or safer products. Um, and moreover, uh, some of these new property rights, such as transferable pollution permits, can actually generate appropriate revenues for the government for, say, uh, dumping uh, wastes in the commons. So I think that is going to be one part of um, uh, the one important force driving towards these alternative systems. The other is international, the growth of integrated international markets. Uh, we in the United States can no longer afford uh, a, a surprisingly clumsy uh, system of regulation that stands out in great contrast uh, with the rest uh, of the free world. And I think these two facts, budget deficits and international competitiveness, are the forces uh, that uh, we have to rely upon, uh, uh, use them in a judo-like way uh, to sweep away uh, uh, the uh, reg prop uh, and uh, have the party of liberty uh, embrace uh, new approaches to achieving uh, goals that can no longer be left to the common law. Thank you. Bob, you want to uh, comment? Yeah, I have a couple of comments on Jim Creer's remarks or questions uh, to him. One is, I think, Jim, you put a lot of stress on the role of ideology uh, in the formation of property systems. Uh, to trivialize it, for example, John, Rock, or John Locke writes a persuasive treatise, and then people go out and create family farms or something. They say Locke really has a pretty good take on this property stuff. Let's go have family farms. Uh, my that's probably not your position, it shouldn't be. Uh, it strikes me that uh, a lot of property institutions probably exist quite independently of ideology. I'm someone who thinks that economics should take more account of ideology, but a lot of basic um, institutions like the family farm arose well before John Locke, for example. We find them in Bill Miller's Iceland. Um, I'm not sure what books they're reading or whether they, uh, you know, they, uh, they're literate there, but uh, they have uh, family farms. The ancient Greeks at the time of Aristotle and Plato have family farms. 
the families are quite different then, uh, as in Iceland, they're extended families and whatever, but you have the in a certain land institutions developing in very different cultural settings, very different times apart from ideology. So I'd be worried about over exaggerating the influence of academic scribblings on the world. They may reflect the world more than influence it. Secondly, I want to get to this comment, and this is where Dick Stewart and I are on the same wavelength about center fielders. Uh, and I'll use, I said I'm going to use the Detroit Tigers, but I don't know the persona, persona I involve, so I'll use the New York Mets. Um, there are two, uh, there are two people who can play center field well for the New York Mets. They have, their names happen to be Lenny Dykstra and Mookie Wilson. And you may see letters to the editor of the type you saw on the headlines about snob zoning to the effect of Mookie Wilson should play for the Mets uh, in center field. He's better than Dykstra or vice versa. This, in fact, is a very difficult choice. The operative facts are very hard to grasp. On the other hand, there are a lot of obvious negatives. My guess is no one in this room, for example, uh, is a viable third candidate to play center field <laughs> for the Mets. Uh, our state of knowledge is not, uh, is not such in a lot of contexts, including regulation or baseball managing, to choose confidently between Mookie Wilson and Lenny Dykstra, but we can certainly reject an awful lot of alternatives, and like Dick, I think we can reject uh, command and control economies in lots of situations and a lot of other variations of regulatory intervention. Uh, so that uh, uh, we've, we've made a lot of progress in policy analysis, in my judgment. Professor Creer. Um, if you want me to be skeptical about the power of ideology, too, I'm happy to uh, <laughs> do that. Uh, as I understand your position, you're saying that these early farmers hired the Rand Corporation to tell them that farms were the best way to go and went from there based on that. No, that couldn't be it, right? <laughs> So how do we get farms? I'd say trial and error, and I don't for a minute um, deny the extraordinary powerful value of information gained through trial and error. And all that information does is reduce a set of interesting cases. I'm not saying that there aren't cases that you can't get facts on. I'm saying that interesting cases are by definition cases that you can't get good facts on. If I overstated the case a little bit, um, what was Rapkin's remark referring to Bacon, better a short provocation than a long what? Uh, elucidation or long boring elucidation? You know, what the hell's wrong with a long boring provocation? Um, <laughs> the problem is that, that um, so I mean, to me, trial and error is the answer. And I'm talking about the set of questions that remains when we can't rely on trial and error because the problems are new or because trial and error is not a safe way to go, for example, in trying to figure out what's a good nuclear strategy. And I will, I will stick, you know, let's run it up the flagpole. It either deters or it doesn't, right? Um, you'll learn a lesson. It might not be very interesting, though. Um, so I, I, I'm inclined to, to uh, I'll, I'll pull in my horns a little bit, but I'm, I'm inclined to stick to the view that, that um, on what I've called these interesting questions, and I grant it, now someone could say, well, just what the hell is an interesting question, and why don't you define that, and we could spend the rest of our lives here. Let me speak elliptically, all right? Um, where the hell was I now? Let me, <laughs> Richard, where are you? I need your capacity. Turn the Niagara Falls back on. Um, that I think for every Peltzman there is a Kelman. I mean, go read Mark's um, response to Sam Peltzman's studies in Virginia, the thing called democracy bashing. I mean, this utterly perplexing piece because if there's anything that I thought the crits would bash, it's the government. And there's Mark bashing the bashers of the government. Um, he was put in a hard place because he doesn't like the government and he doesn't like Peltzman. The question is, which is easier to bash in the Virginia Law Review, I guess. Um, you know, I think Mark's study was convincing in the sense that it said that Peltzman's study wasn't convincing if you looked at it in a rigorous way. And I think that Huber's work on risk is convincing until you try and make the case on the other side and you end up pretty agnostic and you start looking for other grounds on which to base your decision. You know, and I'll, 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 I'll stick to that. I don't know what Russia and the United States have got to do with it. I mean, Russia, the vodka is cheaper and here it's more expensive. It's colder there, it's warmer here. Um, I don't know how a Russian feels about Russia. Maybe they love it. You can't assess 
mean, if you're saying, Dick, look, we don't want to be Russia, do we? I mean, we don't need a lot of careful studies to document that point, I take it. On the other hand, um, I don't see the Russians getting too eager to be us, although it was announced by that unpronounceable name the other day that communism is dead. We've all witnessed it. And, you know, so I'll, 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 I will stick to my guns, but concede that there might only be one bullet in the chamber. So. Do you, want, you don't want to try to be a law professor in uh, Moscow? Take a turn for 10 years? If, you know, if they pay my way and everything. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get the boondoggles you get, here like you the Harvard guys pages, do. Yes. Yeah, if you can get it, I'll do five. Can we do settle on five years? I think five to 10 is the usual term. <laughs> I'm so happy for you, Judge. You got a joke in. It's wonderful. Can we, can we release the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'd like to uh, comment a little bit on something that Professor Stewart has raised. Uh, that's the idea of uh, emissions trading. Uh, it's, it's something that I'm very interested in, having done some work at the Hoover Institution on that. And I was very pleased to see the uh, approach of uh, using uh, pressure from our budgetary problems and international competitiveness as ways of helping move us towards some of that. I'll raise what was constantly presented as one of the problems to that and uh, for discussion just uh, to get it out on the table and explain a little bit. Uh, how do we move from the system that we have now, which is very oriented toward making sure that every single decision that is made by the private sector not raise any safety problems? How do we move from our atmosphere now of, in some ways, overprotectiveness and constant protectiveness uh, by federal agencies to one where we've got uh, trading going on by the private sector that's not constantly scrutinized by federal agencies? Well, one way, uh, I think you're raising sort of two related questions. One is how do we do, move to new institutional means? Uh, and two, uh, uh, <clears throat> how do we develop more realistic expectations about what we can accomplish by any means? Uh, and on the first, I think it's got to be a, an incremental uh, process, um, some extent of, of trial and error. I think we can build in transferable pollution permits uh, into new initiatives as a, as a first step. For example, acid rain, I think, uh, is a prime example. If we're going to reduce uh, sulfur uh, loadings uh, below what they are now, um, which I think is the stated uh, goal of the new administration, then we ought to do it in the most efficient cost-effective uh, way that encourages as much innovation and, and diversity in, in ways of accomplishing that as possible. So I would hope that new legislation in that area would provide for uh, effectively a tradable uh, permit system. On, on the second point is, uh, well, the lesson of our, uh, a lot of our regulation is less is more. That is, if you're going to regulate to the hilt every time you regulate, then uh, whether it's pesticides or whether it's uh, 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 hazardous uh, air pollutants or whether it's cleaning up the uh, Superfund sites, uh, you don't do very much of it because you can't, you can't take on that task and carry it through um, and achieve perfection without enormous expenditure of resources and litigation. And I, I hope uh, that uh, that lesson uh, will be one that the, the new administration will make uh, credible uh, and that people in the Congress can be educated that less is more. We can do m much more in terms of cleaning up uh, if we have realistic expectations of what we can accomplish. Dick, let me ask you a follow-up question. Um, this, until you get to the, uh, to, the, to the bottom line, the last consideration, this doesn't sound like an obvious sell to people who would be getting the less, namely less power. Le le for legislators, for regulators, less control less ability to command, all in the interest of a more efficient and productive uh, economy on the way to, achieve, to achieving the, uh, the uh, same goals in terms of, say, pollution control. But you very cleverly then introduced the possibility that the right to do these things could be 
uh, priced. That is to say, uh, there would be a revenue enhancement for the uh, government and for the Congress as an offset. I wonder if you aren't uh, grabbing a tiger by the tail here and whether, whether going down uh, this path won't uh, invite the Congress uh, as their needs for revenue uh, press to uh, tax, uh, instead of regulate, to tax the right to do everything that they would otherwise regulate to the point where the economy comes to a screeching halt. Well, I think the other, the other, the other tiger, that's uh, the uh, countervailing tiger, is the international competitiveness part of it. And uh, I think that, uh, say, an EPA, probably the fastest growing uh, branch there is going to be the branch that deals with international matters. Because I think uh, with uh, the integration in the European community, um, and uh, the growth of international markets, uh, that problem is going to be right up front. So I think there is a side constraint. Here. Of course, one approach that EP in particular has adopted is to try to export the same level of regulatory oppression to other countries <laughs> so that we don't have a competitive disadvantage. Okay. Now let's take questions from the, uh, from the floor. Okay. Um, first, I think, Professor Stewart, you. you um, you found the coinage that you were looking for. You said you didn't know how to give a name to these regulatory property rights. Mm -hmm. And then later on, you call them, you call this a neo-feudal regime. You could just call them neo-feudal rights, because I think that's what you're talking about. <laughs> and then, and, and I don't like the spin on it. Sorry. <laughs> well, you said, you said, um, you know, how are we going to break out of this? And, and there's no easy way to break out of this. Um, I'll direct this to you and, and not to um, Judge Ginsburg, uh, so as not to put Judge Ginsburg on the spot. Um, why isn't this an area in which the courts could do an awful lot to break out of it? Because although people keep referring to um, Charles Fried's uh, formula where we can't have an ACLU strategy, this doesn't require an ACLU strategy. This isn't a case we are asking the courts to say to a legislature, uh, you simply may not do this. Or at least much of the time you don't have to do that. You don't have to have the ACLU style frontal assault on the legislature. All you have to do is ask the courts to do what, as Peter Huber shows us, they're doing all the time, which is just taking away private property rights. I mean, why, why couldn't you say to um, the DC Court of Appeals, um, just don't recognize the Natural Resources Defense Council when they come into court. Just you know, find some way of uh, preventing them from cashing in their uh, neo-feudal um, property rights. Yeah. Well, Isn't I, that promising? I, I think at a non-subconstitutional level, I think there's a lot to be done, which is, I, th is I think, uh, effectively giving more running room uh, to uh, the executive branch, uh, as, the, as the court did, uh, the Supreme Court did, uh, on, the, on the bubble uh, policy, saying uh, we're going to read the Clean Air Act to allow you some room for experimentation. Um, so I think that's right, uh, the, uh, sort of the administrative law level, in terms of giving more flexibility to uh, the executive and uh, cutting back on the opportunities for uh, uh, sort of, you know, private advocates to come in and create new property rights uh, through administrative law. I think that is something the courts can appropriately do and it is an appropriate focus. Question, please uh, come to the microphones uh, if you have uh, questions or comments. In the interim, I uh, wonder whether, whether Gail, you want to address that. I'll, uh, uh, oh, Gail, yeah. were you about to? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I would say the discussion, just to reemphasize a point, is we in law schools greatly overemphasize federal law. And the recent exchange we just had is a, is a debate about the role of federal courts and about the shape of federal law. It's very hard to know how federal regulation sort of stacks up in its quantity against state and local regulation, but it would not surprise me just at a head count, for example, and I know in the land use area you really get up to, you may get into over 100,000 people involved in that system of regulation, is that a lot of our regulation in this country is at the state and local level. So then as a positive matter, interesting question is why do we in law school spend all our time talking about federal law? And I think the an obvious first uh, take on that is that there are efficiencies of scale both for teachers and for students to master that body of law because if you are a master of the zoning system in Washtenaw County, um, this gives you fewer tools on the job market and whatever. Um, but I do think this is a major bias that we have uh, as academics and that we are missing the boat uh, when we're talking about re regulation if we uh, always talk about federal regulation and we only get the perspective of federal judges rather than uh, state and local judges. So I think this, there's a larger problem here. And if we're serious about federalism, incidentally, what James, uh, James Madison wants 
is for people in the Federalist Society to get serious about local government to be the equivalent of the mayor of Burlington, the, the flip side of the mayor of Burlington who's a socialist, and experiment with new mechanisms at the state and local level. And uh, I think I urge the Federalists to get more serious about uh, our federal system. Okay, I have to follow up on that a little bit. Uh, clearly, I don't think uh, deferring just to the Environmental Protection Agency is going to get very far on tradable emissions credits. Uh, they're clearly fans of heavy-handed regulation as well, but certainly within the states, there's been a lot of attempt to innovate, and much of that was stifled by the structure of the Clean Air Act that required uh, federal approval of every detail of state programs. And I think if we could change uh, one thing on the regulatory arena for environmental activities, it would be to allow more state innovation. Let me just uh, follow on on that. I, I think Bob is quite right. The reason we, Breyer and Stewart focuses on federal statutes is the same reason that case books focus on appellate decisions. Uh, um, um, one of the aspects of our command and control um, federal regulatory structure is, is, has been touched on uh, by Ms. Norton uh, is that it stifles uh, state flexibility and choice, uh, in part because the federal government uh, is using legal prescriptions to try to regulate behavior, uh, but there are uh, several hundred thousand sources of air pollution, several hundred thousand sources of water pollution, uh, a million hazardous waste generators, uh, as defined uh, by statute and regulation, and it's impossible for the federal government to set up the legal administrative machinery to do that job directly. So what it's done is piggybacked on the states. And, and conscripted state authority, either baldly or through the use of conditional grants, to make them uh, pawns or agents in carrying out uh, these uh, federal uh, command and control approaches. So an another benefit uh, of a move towards uh, alternatives is not merely uh, freeing up the private sector, but freeing up uh, state governments uh, to, uh, uh, to try things that are now forbidden uh, under our existing system. Another question? Uh, yes, for Professor Creer. I was a little bit unclear about your, your position when you were talking about the relationship between facts in interesting cases and then you talked about our not being able to discern very clearly what the facts are in interesting cases and then there was this talk about ideology and faith and then up to theology. <clears throat> and I was wondering, well, you missed theory. You didn't say any, uh, anything about a relationship to theory and facts in interesting cases. And I was just wondering exactly what your position is on that. Is it, is it a good thing to have a, a theory when you can't discern the facts in interesting cases to sort of guide you? I mean, I don't know if I know what a fact is if I don't have a theory, okay? So, I mean, I, I believe mm -hmm. in theory. Um, I mean, I certainly never touch facts in any of the work I do, or at least not very much. You know, I like to do theory. Um, so I don't think it has anything to do with theory, but there'll be a Peltzman theory that seems to be generated by the Peltzman facts, and there'll be a Kelman theory that seems to be generated by the Kelman facts. And what I'm saying is that there is a Peltzman ideology. And it, by the way, the point of my remarks, I think people are all buying into the wrong thing here. The point of my remarks is this is a great, good thing, and people should proudly stand up and say it is all faith, which I admired Peter Huber for saying last night, even though he gave away the whole ship when he did it, and he said it's all faith. We all reason from anecdotes. The problem is that if you have the burden of proof, that means you lose, unless you can get down to carrying the ideological uh, contest. So I think that there's an ideology, as I said, I think that drives the facts one seeks out, and if one seeks facts in a reflective way, I mean, you're constantly gathering facts against a theory and shaping a theory against facts. It's a chicken-egg problem. You don't think of one coming before the other in, in terms of the cognitive process. Um, I think it's a, in these what I call interesting areas. It's, a, it's, it's good to get things down to the ideological. People, I, I would have thought you all did this naturally. I would have thought you found my remarks, and perhaps this is the case, utterly unprovocative. Uh, but not asinine. I mean, obvious. Why is this guy telling us ideology is the important thing? Why is why are they here? And then you want to you want to get into talking about the managerial advantages of 
of marketable rights against um, command and control regulation. Well, you know, Judge Ginsburg, Judge Ginsburg puts a very good question, and it, it relates in a way to uh, Professor Fried's remarks, I think. Uh, when he talked about the wealth transfer that results if one markets these rights. I mean, ask Dick to give some estimations of the amount of wealth that we transferred mm -hmm. from pollution sources to the government. I don't know if, I don't even know if I know of the name that attaches to that number of zeros, okay? It's a huge, huge wealth transfer, and if not, now, am I saying pollution is good? The hell with it? No, I happen to think marketable rights are probably a, a pretty good thing, but not because you can make some convincing case that they're going to save a lot of money or anything else. I'm inclined to think that if we look back later, I mean, deregulation is a great thing. Now everyone pisses and moans because they can't get on an airplane or because they get off too quickly, you know. <laughs> um, But the answer to your question is, sure you need theory, but ideology drives theory. You should be talking ideology. You should be talking about the political significance of buying into marketable rights, which is not to say I want to knock it. I joined Dick in the program. So Stephen Kelman, read Stephen Kelman's book on what price incentives. Do I think it's right? No, I think it's silly, but he directs the question. What are the political implications of buying into this and saying, that uh, and letting regulation move toward the market. I think he's utterly wrong for one reason, because in fact, probably the opposite is happening. That the government gathering up the market, let's marketeer, not regulate, in fact, co-ops what I would think would be ideological objections from people about that very device. If this is not an answer to your question, I'm sorry, but I repeat again that the question was, don't I think theory is important? Yes, I think theory is important. Well. Just one follow-up. Do you, I mean, do you recognize any difference between theory and ideology? Sure. I mean, I, I uh, for example, I'll say this maybe hypothetically, I'm agnostic, remember. Um, I believe in God, but I don't have a theory of God's existence. Okay. I even believe in Darwinism, but I don't have a theory of it because I haven't studied it carefully enough. Okay. I believe in a lot of things that I don't have theories for. I believe a lot of things that there are no theories for. I believe a lot of things that there are theories for that I don't know. I believe a lot of things that there are theories for that I do know. But I think faith and theory are utterly different things. Theory is a way of searching for facts. It's a way of cutting out cognitive noise. Ideology is faith. This is what I believe. Why? And someone, by asking you why, pushes you to a deeper fundamental. Why do you believe in property rights? It's not because, oh, they're so much better. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. That's what all of these People, I don't know, they're conservative relative to you, they're sure as hell conservative relative to me, are talking about. It's nonsense. You can't show property's good, bad. Zoning is effective, zoning's ineffective. Those are the headlines. Property works, property fails. Okay? Talk the ideology, you know. Put your money where your put your mouth where your spirit is, is essentially what I'm saying. I'm reminded of uh, my colleague Victor. No more Rodney. jokes at my expense now. Victor. <laughs> You'll be, com you'll, be compensated. you'll be compensated. <laughs> My colleague Victor Brudney uh, once said uh, in a similar situation, anything you can do, I can do meta. Yeah. Leon Lipson. Uh, was it Lipson comes yeah. originally? John? Professor Ellickson, um, with respect to land use in particular, to what extent is there Tebow-like market-driven competition among jurisdictions to provide the most congenial um, regime. And beyond that context, more generally, to what extent would we have market-driven experimentation by jurisdictions in regulatory, on regulatory questions if sort of there weren't federal level price fixing? I didn't get the last word. Federal price level. fixing. Federal level price fixing, the establishment fixing. of a oh. level below which they can't go. Uh, well, you you cited a very important figure in the theory of, of local government, uh, Charles T. Boo, as who as a graduate student developed the notion that suburbs specialize in their packages of public goods and their financing systems and compete for residents. And there's a lot of support for this. I, I once ran a seminar where students went out and studied the character of a variety of sort of no-name suburbs near Stanford, uh, uh, Stanford campus, and they came back and they, I introduced to them the T. Boo hypothesis before they went out and they didn't take it seriously. And they came back and they said, Boy, this fellow Tibu is really onto something. I mean, these suburbs really are slightly different in interesting kinds of ways. Even though when we drove up and down the freeway, uh, they seemed all the same to us. So there's a interesting market, if you will, for it. 
Uh, I think, in fact, that market is imperfect in the following kind of way, and I'm not sure I'm being responsive to your question, but the local government policies are set by the residents. That's the way the politics works. You have the residents vote, uh, one person, one vote. They, their policies affect the value of assets of landowners, for example, who have no votes, and they don't feel the costs if they zone to declare as open space, for example, some of the prime property there. Now, there may be, those people may give campaign donations and whatever, but that's the major concern there, that the policies are being set by uh, only some of the people affected by those policies, and we know we have very serious problems of parochialism. The market that would exist absent zoning would be uh, specialized communities set up through covenant and homeowners association by developers, and we have a fair amount of that anyway. Uh, the difficulty there is in uh, if you were to switch from zoning, get rid of zoning now, it's very hard to set up ex post homeowners associations on existing neighborhoods in the suburbs, and that's uh, that would be a difficult transition problem. Uh, but I think if you look at uh, land development today, you just read the uh, Sunday advertisements, you see competition of a Tibu sort of a type that I regard as somewhat more reliable than, or a lot more reliable than what we get through zoning policies of suburbs. Sounds like a sort of social contract theory in the subdivision. The developer lays uh, out the I would the say uh, express contract theory. How's that? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, we have time for maybe one more. Anyone? Further comments? Okay, we have a taker or a lever. <laughs> Is that a question coming? Yes. It, it seems to me that some of the most convincing cases for regulation are, are uh, to regulate products of technology that we've seen in the last, say, 50 or 60 years, uh, telecommunications, uh, allocation of electromagnetic spectrum, uh, international pollution, global atmospheric effects, etc. I'm wondering if you feel that these are, are truly incapable of being solved by application of the common law, or if simply the collectivist nature of government, say in the last 60 years, has precluded the, the development of common law to solve these problems. It's an open question. Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, you know, we. Uh, there have been uh, writings about the allocation of the electromagnetic spectrum through uh, common law property, you know, type uh, um, decisions. Um, I think, uh, uh, but I don't think uh, transboundary pollution, or even pollution, uh, if it were all with one in one jurisdiction, of a far-reaching sort, can really be proper, properly handled without two things happening. One is the federal courts in our system would have to get into a lot of uh, uh, private law business. That is, uh, because of uh, jur jurisdictional spillovers and uh, broadcasting and, uh, I suppose, landing rights for airplanes and so forth, uh, you would have enormous increase in the, in the authority and business of the federal courts. And secondly, they would have to turn themselves into administrative agencies. That's the only way that you can uh, um, uh, really, say, carry out uh, a system of pollution control if you have tens of thousands of sources uh, 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 creating acid rain. Now, maybe it could be done, but I think we're better off uh, keeping the courts to the, to the business that they have and having other means, not the prevailing ones, but other means uh, of administrative nature to deal with many of these problems. I, I would think that the, uh, the broadcast, the magnetic spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum could certainly have been, uh, at least would have been well worth uh, seeing whether it couldn't have been exploited through the evolution of, uh, of common law property rights. It's a little more complicated than, say, riparian, or water, or water rights problems, but it's not, it doesn't defy common law development and, and simple rules of, of priority and time and so on could have been used, but the process was truncated before it got even started by the 1927 Radio Act because the industry was very anxious to have itself regulated quickly to eliminate the interference problems that were, were uh, rampant then. And so the, uh, the uh, government obliged it when they were able to come to an agreement on what the statute would look like. Uh, it was an unfortunate but, uh, but not a typical example of how that decision to regulate is often uh, done without consideration for the alternative because of the urgency felt by the beneficiaries of the regulation who are not anxious to, to wait for a common law development. In the more recent years now, we've seen some of these marketable rights 
ideas emerging in, the, um, in uh, uh, making uh, marketable airport landing slots, for instance, in the, in the Reagan, during the Reagan administration, and in uh, creating uh, limited entitlements to the continued manufacture of asbestos, phasing them out over years, but over a period of 10 years, but allowing them to be traded freely among the manufacturers. Uh, so the, the intellectual milieu is a little different, perhaps, uh, and I think a lot depends on whether demand for regulation is coming from an industry or from uh, in the social risk area. I think that uh, what we've seen is both increasing interdependence of uh, people want to uh, between themselves because of increasing population, increasing pollution, increasing technology. But I think we also, as a separate issue, are increasing understanding of what causes harm, just purely understanding the science of it, uh, has helped in making some changes that I'm not sure the legal system is really able to cope with. And I think had it had more opportunity to evolve without having regulatory uh, decisions made uh, quickly, uh, we might have been able better to cope with. Uh, under the common law, everyone had a sphere in which they were able to operate on their private property without that being considered harm to others. You could dump a can of <coughs> solvents out in your backyard and not suddenly have a hazardous waste site and be viewed as harming the entire ecosphere by your action. You just dumped something and that was the end of it. And now, as we get more and more understanding of how every little thing that we do can potentially have environmental harm, we have less and less of a sphere in which we as individuals can operate. And I think that is having very much of a sociological impact that perhaps exceeds what we really ought to be trying to do from a purely public health perspective. The time has come to remind you that the next panel will begin promptly at 2.15 and to ask you to join me in thanking our panelists. Mm -hmm.